Good afternoon. For the record, my name is Liz Braden, District Councillor uh, for District 9, Alston Brighton. I'm the Chair of the Boston City Council Committee on Housing and Community Development. Today is Tuesday, July 30th, 2024. This hearing is being recorded and it is also being live streamed at boston.gov backslash city dash council dash TV and broadcast on Xfinity Channel 8, RCN Channel 82 and Fios Channel 6, 964. Written comments may be sent to the committee email at cc.housing at boston.gov and will be made a part of the record and available to all councillors. Public testimony will be taken at the end of this hearing. Individuals will be called on in the order in which they are signed up and will have two minutes to testify. If you're interested in testifying in person, please add your name to the sign-up sheet near the entrance of the chamber. If you're looking to testify virtually, please email our central staff liaison, Karishma Kuhan, uh, at Karishma, K-A-R-I-S-H-M-A, dot C-H-O-U-H-A-N at boston.gov for the link for the link and your name will be added to the list. Today we will discuss two dockets. Docket uh, 0633, message and order for your, for your approval, an order author authorizing the City of Boston acting through its Mayor's Office of Housing to accept and expend payments in the amount of $50 million dollars no, $40 million, beg your pardon, $40 million given to the City of Boston's, uh, given to the City of Boston's Inclusion Redevelopment Policy Fund. The City of Boston's uh, Inclusion Redevelopment Fund, IDP, was established by an executive order <coughs> in February 2000 to support the production and preservation of affordable housing in new market rate housing developments. Docket number 0695, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $5 million in the form of a grant to provide uh, rapid rehousing services together with wraparound support and recovery services to individuals with a history of homelessness awarded by the Massachusetts Department of Public Health to be administered by the Mayor's Office of Housing. The grant will f fund the state ARPA earmark for the Mayor's Office of Housing. These matters were sponsored by the Mayor and were referred, to, uh, referred on April 3rd and April 10th, 2024. I am joined today by my colleagues in order of arrival, uh, Councillor Ed Flynn, District 2, and myself. Uh, I also uh, have I'll read those into the... I have two letters of absence which I'll read into the record later. Um, Councillor Flynn, do you have any opening remarks? No, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to, I'd like to um, now to introduce today's panellists testifying on behalf of the administration. Sheila Dillon, uh, Chief of Housing and Director of the Mayor's Office of Housing. Daniel Lesser, Chief of Staff, of the Mayor's Office of Housing, and Rick Wilson, Director of Administration and Finance of the Mayor's Office of Housing. Good afternoon, thank you for being here. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I would like to take docket 0695 uh, first, and then we'll go on to the, um, uh, the Inclusionary Development Policy uh, Grant, or fund funding, okay? So, uh, you have the floor. Wonderful. I'll just uh, thank you for having this hearing, Housing Chairperson, Council uh, Braden, and I'm very happy to see uh, Councillor Flynn here as well to discuss two two matters before you. And I, I just want to thank my staff for doing such a thorough job of, of preparing us for this hearing, but also really being very, very good stewards of this important funding. Um, without further ado, I'm going to hand this over to Chief of Staff Dan Lesser. Um, as all of you know, we've been working very, very hard with our public health uh, commission here in Boston and the state 
to really help those that are in recovery. Um, although we don't oversee recovery, we often are called upon to help people with housing uh, services and housing resources after they leave treatment or while they're in treatment if they're receiving treatment at home. So we're very excited to receive this funding from the state and Dan's gonna walk you through um, what we received the funding for and what we uh, plan on doing with it. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Chief Dillon, and thank you, Chair Braden and Councillor Flynn for having us today. Um, so we're here today to ask for the council to accept and spend $5 million of state funds that were appropriated through the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Acts of 2022 and administered by the Department of Public Health. Um, the $5 million is coming from State American Rescue Plan Act funds. Um, and what the state earmark is designated for is post-treatment supportive housing. So specifically for rapid rehousing services, which includes a rental assistance, so 24 months of support for rent, as well as housing stabilization and wraparound services for individuals exiting recovery programs. Um, with the, with, and with a history of homelessness in Boston. So the idea is, um, as individuals who are suffering some substance abuse disorder um, are coming into recovery, that they, uh, as they are exiting, that they um, don't have the risk of returning to homelessness and returning to some of the situations that may cause them to um, have further issues, issues around substance abuse. And so um, with the $5 million, we will work with nonprofit partners to set up programs to allow for this rental assistance and um, wraparound services to transition individuals to stable long-term housing. Um, we've run many rapid rehousing programs. We run many rapid rehousing programs and we generally have very strong outcomes around people not returning to homelessness um, after that 24 month period. And we're very hopeful that this could be a key intervention um, for individuals in Boston who are facing these challenges. Um, a little on the specifics of the funding, um, since this is ARPA funding, um, it must be spent by December 31st, 2026. Um, and so once the council, um, and assuming the council accepts and spends the $5 million, we will work very expeditiously to put out a request for proposal for nonprofit partners where we've already started drafting that request for proposals and identifying, uh, listening to um, providers and individuals to how to shape that um, the program and then we'll put out an RFP, we'll select providers in the coming months and then we'll try to stand up a program as fast as possible so that we can make sure that we can fund the full 24 months prior to December 31st, 2026. Thank you. Um, so the, the money, will it be spent on, on programming or will it be assistance in setting up Home, um, homes as well. Um, so it will mostly go towards the rental assistance, but will also um, cover staffing costs for those wraparound services. So kind of visits from caseworker and um, access to other services for the um, individuals in the uh, who are um, in the housing. Sounds good. And I know we have the Billy McGonigal home in in Austin. Mm -hmm. We had a, a, a ribbon cutting fairly recently, and that's. That's the sort of program that this money will be go to support. True, or if I could, um, it, it will also just pay for someone rent. You know, if there's not a, if there's not space in some of those longer residential programs, um, someone leaving treatment could could just rent an apartment, a, you know, a modest apartment in any of our neighborhoods, get support services. But like Dan said, it's you know we really have seen if there's not a good if if. If a person leaving treatment doesn't have stable housing, so many times they find themselves back on the street and, yes. and back using. So uh, we've been saying this for a long time, and I'm glad that the state thought that we, you know, we could um, manage this program. People really coming out of treatment, there's, they have such a better chance of success if they can get stable housing. And 24 months is a good time to help people, a person pay their rent uh, while they get employment, they get stable. Um, they, you know, connect again with family and friends. So I am happy to see that it's 24 months. Sounds good. Councillor Flynn, did you have questions? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Sheila, to you and your team for the important work that you are doing. Um, Sheila, do you know if any of this money will go toward supporting at-risk veterans or veterans that are experiencing homelessness? 
Um, I can't imagine that it's not because you, you know, as, as uh, probably better than any, that a lot of our veterans uh, are suffering from substance use disorders and there are a lot of in recovery programs. Um, so I am very, very hopeful that a lot of this money will go to, to our, our, our veterans um, and that are currently in programs and getting well. The, as you know, Sheila, the, the fastest growing homeless population, one of the fastest, I should say, is women veterans, and they have unique challenges as well. Um, are you thinking about any, any type of program where we can ensure women veterans, um, including their children, um, have an opportunity to get stable housing here in the city? So I, I think it, given this grant, we can certainly, and I'll hand this over to Dan if, he's, if he and the team have given any thought, but can like really work very, very closely with a lot of our nonprofits that work in substance use disorders and, and make sure that the outreach is being done to, to, to the folks that, veterans in their programs. I don't know if you've given that any thought, Dan. Yeah, I think we're just in the process of reaching out with um, focus groups and in conversation with providers about how to structure the RFP. And so I, um, I, I'll make sure if we haven't already that we are engaging with um, veterans groups. But if, if you think that there are support services that are unique to veterans or organizations that are really dealing with veterans and you'd like to put us in touch with those, Counselor Flynn, we'd be glad to follow up as we design this. Appreciate that. And thank you, Sheila, to you and your team. Uh, Madam Chair, I have no further questions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Flynn. Um, and just before I proceed, I will just read the letters of absence from two of my colleagues. Uh, dear Councillor um, Chair Braden and Mr. Clerk and Council colleagues, please be advised that I'm unable to attend today's Committee on Housing and Community Development hearing on docket 0633 and 0695, a hearing regarding a grant from the MA Depart Massachusetts Department of Public Health and the acceptance and expenditure of payments to the city's uh, Boston's inclusionary development policy fund. My staff will watch the live stream and report back to me with notes. I will follow up with any additional questions upon reviewing the recording and my staff's notes. I sincerely, Enrique Pepin, Boston City Councillor for District 5. I also have a letter of absence, for, uh, uh, apology from uh, City Council President uh, Ruthie Louis-Jean. Uh, dear Councillor Braden, I'm unable to attend the City Council meeting on, uh, Committee on Housing and Community Development hearing on docket 0633 and docket 60695, uh, a hearing regarding a grant from the Massachusetts Department of Public Health and acceptance and expenditure of payments to the City of Boston's Inclusionary Development Policy Fund. These dockets are a vital component, component to addressing the housing needs within our city. I'm particularly interested in the recent transition of the housing compliance staff to monitor and enforce obligations under affordable housing agreements entered into under the IDP from the Boston Planning and Development Agency, the BPDA, to the Mayor's Office of Housing. Given this shift, all affordable housing agreements under the IDP should be formally and legally assigned to the, Mass uh, the Mayor's Office of Housing. Given this new structure, can the administration provide clarification on how this trans trans transition will impact the monitoring and enforcement of these agreements? Specifically, how can the Council track an individual development's IDP fund commitments through uh, the acceptant, uh, acceptant expenditure cycle as passed through the Council and on to the next housing project? Should you, should you or any member of the public have any questions or concerns, please do not hesitate to reach out to my office directly at 617-635-4376 or to ruthie.louisjean at boston.gov. Sincerely, um, Lucy, Ruthie Louisjean, uh, Boston City Council President. There was a few of her questions. We can maybe address those in the, in the uh, I can bring those up later. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so we can move on to the next docket. <coughs> um, oh, beg your pardon. We've been joined by uh, my colleague, uh, Councillor Tanya Fernandez Anderson of District 7. Okay. Great. So um, 
Once again, uh, thank you for holding this hearing and considering an accept and expend vote for um, inclusionary development funding. This is a, um, this is a rather routine uh, request. Uh, we, we come before the city council with some frequency and request uh, the um, authorization to accept IDP funding that is collected from the development community. Uh, that Treasury holds and that um, and to spend it on really worthwhile projects um, we um, We put this money out we take it very seriously We put this money out in competitive RFPs and work very closely with all of your communities to make sure that what we're funding the community has a say in and certainly uh, shapes the the developments that we do fund I'm going to just go over a couple of introductory slides as I get my computer back um, and then I'll hand it over to Rick Wilson, our ANF director, who really does monitor um, all of these collection of funds and the expenditure of. Um, and I do, um, we can talk some too about the compliance that we have taken over uh, as of July 1st of this year from the BPDA. So if I could just to refresh everyone's uh, memory on IDP and what, it, what is currently in place. It is a, uh, it's a policy that uh, began in the year 2000 here, and developers of private residential buildings who meet certain conditions either have to create affordable housing units on-site, off-site, or contribute in some circumstances to uh, a fund, which we uh, oversee. It is currently triggered um, when someone is seeking zoning relief from the city of Boston, and when their project has over 10, 10 units or more, unless, of course, the project is an affordable housing project. 13% of the units must be set aside as income restricted, or if they're building off-site, the percentage is 18, or they pay into a fund that we, were meant, that we mentioned. And if it's a rental project, they're paying somewhere between $200,000 and $380,000 per unit. It was first implemented in 2000 under Mayor Menino, and um, it's been updated several times uh, since then. It's been an incredibly productive program. And it, it, I know it's, um, and I, I got to thank this body for helping us along the way shape it and um, really following it and making sure that the developers working in your community um, are, are at least meeting, if not exceeding the requirements. So since its um, inception, we have created over 4,400 4, units on site, on site in, in buildings, mixed income buildings, uh, many in neighborhoods where we don't have the same percentages of affordable housing as we do in other parts of the city. We've taken the cash that the program has provided and we've created another over you know, 3,400 3, units. So for a total right now of 8,200 units. Um, so really, once again, it's, if you think about Boston, ha Boston has about 58,000 units. This program has, um, has created 8,000 of those. So a very, very productive program that hasn't cost the city anything out of its operating budget. Um, with that, I am going to hand it over to Rick Wilson, uh, our ANF director, who's going to walk through this particular request. Thanks. Thanks, Sheila. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to start with by providing an overview of the IDP uh, fund. Uh, as Sheila mentioned, the IDP fund revenues come from payments uh, in lieu of units. Th those are typically paid in um, over seven years, um, and uh, also from some smaller one-time payments that result of the, from the IDP um, formula. Um, as um, Sheila mentioned, uh, most projects these days, due to intentional changes to the, um, to the policy, most projects are funding, putting their units on-site or off-site. Very few are, are cashing out, uh, paying into the fund um, at this point. Um, so it's, uh, you know, the revenue has been somewhat steady, which I'll go into a little bit later, um, but uh, the number of projects paying in has really diminished uh, over, over time. Um, the funds that come into the IDP fund can be used for the creation and preservation of uh, long-term affordable housing units. Um, they can be rental, home ownership, cooperative, or other forms of permanent or transitional housing. Um, all units uh, have to be uh, have to have an affordable housing restriction. Uh, these are all obviously income um, uh, income restricted. Uh, on the rental side, they have a maximum uh, income limit of 70% of the area median income although many units are restricted to uh, lower incomes. 
And on the ownership side, the maximum income limit is 100% of AMI, though within any, any one project, at least half of the units must, half of the affordable units must be restricted to 80% of AMI uh, or less. And again, just to be clear, I'm talking about the units that are created with the IDP fund. Um, as Sheila mentioned, MOH has the primary responsibility of administering the funds. We track them, we invoice them, we collect, we, uh, we award them through RFPs, as Sheila mentioned. Um, Treasury Department does have a role, but it's merely to receive and deposit and deposit the payments. Oops, I'm sure I'm clicking forward on the right thing here. Okay. Um, so just to uh, provide, Sheila talked about kind of high-level overall accomplishments of the IDP uh, of the policy itself, including on-site and off-site. I'm focusing right here on the uh, accomplishments of, from the IDP fund since MOH took over administration in FY15. Um, in that time, the funds have helped create over 2,300 new units of income-restricted housing um, across almost every neighborhood of the city, over 1,700 new rental units, nearly 600 new home ownership units. Um, in addition, uh, we have uh, preserved or acquired over 600 units of uh, existing rental housing, uh, including 450 unrestricted units that were converted to permanently affordable through the Acquisition Opportunity Program, one of our most successful and impactful anti-displacement uh, programs in the city, um, and 154 units that, were, that have been preserved in perpetuity. So in total, um, between uh, new and, and, and acquired or preserved, over uh, nearly 3,000 units, a little over 2,900 units, um, created or preserved since FY15. Here's the status of the fund um, as, of the, uh, as of right now, actually. Um, in 2014, when we took over administration, the BPDA transferred about $21.5 million uh, from the IDP fund to MOH. Um, since then, we have collected over $163 million in IDP payments into the fund. Um, so total revenue collected through the end of uh, FY24 was about $184.5 million. We're projecting to collect around $34 million uh, this fiscal year, uh, which will bring our total revenue through the end of this year uh, to be $218.8 million. On the expenditure side, uh, through those RFPs that Sheila mentioned, the Acquisition Opportunity Program, the Neighborhood Homes Initiative, uh, we have funded $143 million uh, into projects. We are projecting to fund uh, over $65 million in projects um, this fiscal year. Now that's, uh, that's subject to change. This includes projects that have been awarded um, that are due for a commitment that we expect to commit this year. Um, this also includes you know, projects that um, you know, are in our pipeline. They're known projects, these are identified projects. We're not just making them up out of thin air. They're real, they're real projects. Um, but it is, of course, it's possible that for, because they're waiting for state funding or for other reasons, they will get pushed into next year, but we do need to make sure that we have the funding set aside for them when they need that, um, when they need that funding commitment. Uh, in addition, we uh, do use a portion of the IDP revenue to fund program management costs uh, to the tune of about $10 million over the past nine years and including this coming year, this, this current fiscal year. Um, so total expenditure, projected expenditures through the end of this year, again, of $218.8 million. We try to balance our budgets here. Um, and I think the takeaway here, councilors, is that we have you know, a very strong pipeline of projects. Um, we are uh, you know, spending every uh, penny of IDP revenue um, uh, trying to get it out as, uh, you know, as quickly as possible into um, impactful projects all over, all over the city. So, which brings us to today's request. Um, as, as you mentioned, Councilor, we're requesting $40 million uh, today um, in authority to collect and accept and expand IDP funds. This is the seventh time we're coming before the City Council. Um, so far, we have authority to accept and expend $184.9 million. So, with this $40 million request, that will take us to just under 20, $225 million, which, again, will, um, we think will last us through the end of this fiscal year, maybe a little bit into next fiscal year, depending on the timing of um, collections. Um, we did uh, prepare a few, uh, just some samples of projects that we have recently um, funded or that have recently funded or been completed with IDP funds. Um, the first is Parcel 25, Phase A in Mission Hill. This is, a, uh, this is 46 units of mixed income affordable rental housing um, near the Roxbury Crossing MBTA station. Um, 775 Huntington uh, Ave in Mission Hill, 12-story uh, mixed-use, mixed-income mixed development, 112 units, including 57 rental and 55 uh, home ownership. 
Oh, sorry, I'm clicking forward <laughs> on my computer, but not on the slide up here. So that's 775 Huntington right there. Um, Stonely Brooklyn in Jamaica Plain, uh, 45 income restricted home ownership units, including five live work studios. Um, Magnolia Woodford uh, Roxbury, this is part of our neighborhood homes initiative, I think, on formerly city, city owned land, seven units of mixed income housing. Um, uh, including five income restricted units, and these will be held under a ground lease with Dudley Neighborhoods, Inc. We do work with um, community land trusts uh, using IDP funds as well. Uh, over in East Boston, the Aileron Home Ownership Project, which is seven units of uh, income restricted home ownership uh, units, again on formerly city owned land. And finally, um, parcel 12C in Chinatown, which is a mixed income unit development with 36 home ownership units and 96. Rental, uh, rental units on land that was uh, owned by the planning department. And that concludes our presentation, Council. Sheila, any closing remarks? No, uh, that's just a sample of, of some of the projects that we've done recently, um, just to illuminate how we're spending the money. Thank you. But thank you, Rick. Thank you. Um, I, apologize. I have to apologize to my consular uh, colleague, um, Tanya Fernandez-Anderson. I, I wasn't aware of you in my, on my Vision, field of vision is restricted back there, so I'm sorry I missed you earlier. Uh, we've also been joined by Councillor uh, Fitzgerald and Councillor Worrell. Um, so, um, Councillor Fernandez Anderson, do you, um, you're first in the line after Councillor Flynn, so your questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Chief, everyone. Good to see you. Good Hello. to see you. Um, just uh, some quick questions. I guess on the math, it just feel, felt like we were going a little bit over budget, so I was just curious. Um, on Over here, it, was, it took us to um, the projected uh, uh, with FY25, uh, 218 million, but then um, total authorization on the second page will bring us to 224 million. Yeah, I mean, this is, so this is how we've approached these requests in the past is, you know, we, there are, um, you know, well, I guess the, the number of uh, projects paying into the fund, as I mentioned, has diminished over time, but these are all based on projections, so we typically request a little bit more than we think we're going to get, and, and uh, this way it just gives us some, some cushion in case a payment comes in that we weren't expecting because of something getting, getting triggered or a project pulling a permit that triggers a payment that we didn't have on, you know, that we were tracking but didn't know was going to come in during this fiscal year. We don't want to be in a position where we can't accept it or we can't expend it because we're bumping up against our expenditure, our, our um, appropriation authority. Um, so we think this will, like I said, uh, the $218 million in, in projected revenue that we're expecting by the end of this fiscal year, it is just a projection. Uh, I think it's a solid projection, but this gives us a little bit of cushion in case uh, some additional funding comes, comes in. But regardless, we'll be back in front of you within a year, maybe a year and a half, uh, again, requesting additional, additional authority for future, future um, payments into the fund. Thank you. Um, and Chief, do you, how do you guys prioritize or how do you figure out if it's going to be a unit or instead of payment in lieu of? Yeah, so it's a, it's a fabulous question. And so usually it comes out of a community process in part. Um, and I will say that over the, especially over the last five or six years, we've been very interested in projects uh, meeting their obligation on site or very, very, very close to the market rate development. Uh, because in many neighborhoods, this is how they're creating affordable housing. Um, and then, but sometimes um, when you do the math, the the cash out is so significant, especially if it's a, like a downtown home ownership project. And we look at the needs across the city. We say, you know what, this makes sense. We'll, we'll be able to help so many more uh, families. So it's part community process, part doing the math, but. I would say the vast majority of the times we do want the units on site to create mixed income diverse communities. Uh, thank you. You listed certain projects here that we are already working on. Mm -hmm. Do you have an idea of how this 40 million is going to be expended? So I'll hand over to Rick, but the, I mean, we, are, we will put out an RFP or we are about to put out an RFP. Um, uh, and I think it's actually making its way through the, the process now. I'm looking at someone for a nod. Uh, so we will competitively, we put it out, we, we're comp they're competitive. 
we, um, we underwrite them, we review them as they come in. So it's a really competitive process to get the funding. We are looking for affordable housing in areas where their percentage is lower, just because I know that's a concern of yours, where we don't see as much affordable housing. We're looking for neighborhood, other neighborhoods to step up if the percentages are low. So that it's a competitive process that has a lot of eyes. <clears throat> we also look for um, we also look for to see that they have met with your offices, just because I think that's important to us, and that you're fully aware of what's being proposed in your neighborhoods. That was going to be my next thing. Um, <laughs> in terms of the AMI, 80% um, mm -hmm. is steep even for a city councilor, right? Um, so we're, I, I, I guess I'm trying to figure out, like, you know, in terms of other types of revenue, how do we diversify this income coming in so that we can do more. Yeah. So the AMIs on um, the requirements are, are higher typically than what the applications coming in because they're sort of mixing funding sources and a lot of those funding sources are going to bring down the incomes. But we were talking about that in the office today and yesterday. It, because Boston's AMIs are set, uh, it's Boston and then it's a lot of very wealthy cities and towns around us that influence our AMIs because they're set by the federal government. We are really looking at the AMIs re lately that they've just seemed to have gone up beyond anything we can recognize. So we are going to be looking for projects that come into the funding round that are really serving Boston residents and we're looking for lower AMIs. So even though it's an up to, we're going to be looking for AMIs that, like I said, serve our families and our seniors. Can you speak to the other criteria you'd be looking for? Sure, and I can send it over to you. But um, and it's it's so we're looking for those that serve disabled populations, families, of course, seniors, city-owned land where we're not seeing as much affordable housing or there's lower percentages. Um, I can get you over the list. There's probably a ten or twelve criteria or, or priority pri priorities, but I can get that over to you this afternoon. Um, it does feel like. The rest of my questions, I can reach out to you. Yeah. I think it's an excellent program. Thank you so much for all Sure, that. and and your feedback is is always welcome. And um, but I do I do hear your voice sometimes when we're when we're designing things. So I'm taking certainly the comments about making sure that every neighborhood has affordable housing to heart. I hear your voice every time I think about housing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I I am very interested in the. Um, anti-displacement efforts coming soon, hopefully. Um, so looking forward to talking to you about that. I'm yeah. very, very excited with, for that conversation. The, in the planning, the displacement? Yes. Does, yes, yes, we are too. Um, we've had some really good conversations with a lot of the advocates and groups that have been bringing this forward. And um, I, think it's, I think it's great. It's pretty comprehensive. So yeah, look forward to working with you. Likewise. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fernandez. Councillor Fitzgerald, you're next. I'm, I'm giving everybody seven minutes, so I think we've gone over, but That's fine. Yeah, we're good. Uh, we have a small much. group, so we, we can keep it moving. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, uh, folks, Sheila Brick, sure. for coming here today. Um, I was thinking about one of the stats you said uh, that this, uh, about out of 58,000 units, that, that is mm -hmm. entirety in the city uh, that, that we currently have? Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's a, I think it's yeah. 57 in, Ballpark. yeah. Yeah. Um, and about 8,000, so the rough math is about one-seventh of the, of the housing. Apart, un, apartments or, you, uh, or I mean, residen, all residential? All residential. Okay, so about a seventh of all residential, if I'm saying this right, it has been built off without city budget. Of our affordable right. housing portfolio, yes. Of the affordable housing. Yes. If you were to add what we use in the city budget to build affordable housing, what percentage do you think we're at, or a fraction do you think we're at of those 58,000? Say that again. <laughs> like, <laughs> if you said we, we build about a seventh of it with, uh, off the books. Yep. Right? Now, if you put in, if you added what we do use on the books and then sort of totaled it all up, what would be the percentage of that 58,000 that we built? Yeah. We, 58,000 is just our income. Yeah, this, so about yeah, Council, if, you're asking, if you're asking sort of about like the actual city funding that goes into for affordable housing development, is that what you mean? Like of city resources, like general fund dollars, or or just the amount of those units, right? That we have currently already created or yep. have built with on the books money. Yeah. 
So about 14, I just did the math though. So there's about 58,000 units of deed restricted affordable housing in the yep. city. I think there's about 300,000 units of housing, yep. like generally. Got gotcha. And 8,000 have, have been created out of this program. So it's about 14% okay. of, the, of our total affordable housing um, portfolio is inclusionary units. Gotcha. Okay, so then there was part B. Uh, part B was if we were to just look at that 58,000 affordable units yeah. and add both the off the books for through the IDP that we've done and the city, but any investment the city has made on the books and totaled it up. What, what is the total of the affordable units the city has kind of put forward? Oh, Lord. I, I think I'd have to like spend some spend time some, with yeah. that math because yeah. there, some of that, the 58,000 also includes a BHA, which we're now putting money in, yep. as you know, to renovate, but we didn't necessarily fund them in the, in a, in the beginning. Yep. Um, there's the IDP units that we don't fund, and then there is the varied programs that we did use our funding to create. So I think I'm gonna get you a summary if that's okay, but I wanna yeah. give it a little bit of no. thought and I wanna do a little research. Yeah, and th these aren't leading questions. I don't have, I'm not trying to get to a point. It's more just understanding, yeah. right, of, okay, the, 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 the fact just struck me. The stat yeah. struck me and say, oh, well, I wonder how much we do if we add the money we do put into it. And right. then how much yeah. of that is a total and how much is otherwise. So um, that's fantastic. Obviously very familiar with IDP over the years. It's been a very successful program. Um, it does include when commercial is built, right? So commercial triggers linkage, right? Right. Which, Some, which slightly goes, different, yeah. So slightly different, is. but we also um, so for folks that are watching, um, when a, com a developer comes forward and is developing a commercial building and it's over a hundred thousand square feet, we take a little fee and it's pretty small against the total development costs. Mm -hmm. And they, we take that fee and we make it available to create affordable housing too. We have workforce development and yes. housing that yes. comes out of no. linkage. Correct, right? correct. Um, and so that is that is not included in an inclusionary development policy fund. That is a separate, separate. housing yeah. fund. Separate. Okay. Mm -hmm. No, that's great. Um, no, I, I, you know, I really don't have any further questions. Is familiar, and I, this is really just the authorization. Is this more the transfer from BPDA to you all? I know that happened back in 2014, but is this with it now being a planning department? Is this more of like a? Uh, Process handover. It, is it, this... That's not that's not what this request is. I mean, okay. yes, we are we are we are obviously dealing with that as well. Have the transfer having just happened in July first of yeah. of this year. But no, this this is routine. We've been doing this 2014. Uh, you know, under Mayor Wall, she transferred the administration of the fund from BPD. Well, you know, from yep. then BRA to then D and D. Yep. Um, and so since 2014, we have been managing the funds, mm -hmm. and we've come every. Um, that's the slide that I'm presenting right here, Councilor. I know you 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 um you may have missed this one, but um, this is the seventh time we've come in front of the council asking for um, this this authority to accept yep. and expend these funds. So it's been been nine years that we've been managing yep. this, um, taking it in, putting it out uh, into projects, and it's but always been. If I could just add one thing, and it was uh, Council President mentioned okay. it in her letter too. On uh, July one, we did take over the. Um, the oversight, the compliance piece of inclusionary development. So making sure that folks' income qualify and we're looking at all of our policies to be user-friendly and, and certainly um, different than they have been in the past and making sure that uh, every year we're sort of making sure that uh, the, the, not the right people in the units, but the people that have signed up for the units are there and that all questions are answered, et cetera. So we've taken over the compliance unit. So far, so good. No, great. It, it's always been in great hands since 2014, so you guys have done a wonderful job. I know I did miss my last question. is just on the previous $5 million grant, because I'm sorry I, I yeah. came late. Um, but I'm just excited to see that it, its impact uh, on the Mass and Cass area and, and the focus that we've sort of reinvigorated there at the time, giving we've it's the same issue, but slightly different now as it's sort of spread out into the neighborhood. So um, I, I hope that that can really be put to use to, to keep people from uh, to keep them in housing and from returning to the area mm -hmm. as, as we try to do that. So um, I just want to say thank you for that, and I look forward to in any way our office can be helpful Great. in that. Uh, we'd love to be a part of it. So thank you so much. Thank you. Great. Uh, that's all, Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Worrell, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair, thank you, Chair and thank you um, to Chief Dillon and team for being here. Um, the 58,000, um, you said that included BHA unit, mm -hmm. how, how many of that is BHA? It, and yeah, I mean, it's something that could get back yeah, to me. I, I guess I'll, I'll I just want to know the real number. Of, I'll get back to it's less than twenty thousand. I want to say it's okay. around fifteen thousand, but I'll get I'll get the exact number for you. That's BHA. BHA. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, and then um, the payment in lieu of unit formula, um, I see that we're spending well, 200 to 380,000 per unit. Yeah. Is that, I mean, I, I hear from developers and contractors all the time, interest rates has gone up, mm -hmm. construction prices has gone up, material has gone up. Does that fluctuate or is that has been the same for the last seven years? that has changed to reflect you know the current market conditions it has not changed it's been in place since 2015 the same um, it's the same um, so it's right it's three it's um, 380 in the more downtown locations and 200 for rental and then what the slide doesn't say and I caught this a little earlier is that it doesn't um, it doesn't go over the uh, the, for, the home ownership buyout, which is more of a differential, the average costs of a market rate condo mm -hmm. minus the average cost of an affordable housing, uh, affordable unit divided by two. So, um, you know, the, I think we are in, we are in unusual times, certainly. Um, it is very, it's hard to build out there. Equity costs are more expensive. Construction costs are more expensive. And there is a slowdown, and I, I I know that you're working on, and everybody's sort of like trying to trying to figure out a way to jumpstart a very very large approved pipeline of projects. So, um, but this has not changed. All right. And it, how how does this change? Is it just a policy within MOH? It's a policy now, um, but it we do have we have been authorized to put it into zoning in 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 the fall. Got it. And any any. Um thought when you put it into zoning in the fall to make sure that we're adjusting for yeah. market it's, conditions? It's being evaluated right now. It's being evaluated as we speak. We're trying to understand the market conditions against the requirements. Awesome. Um, and I will definitely push to see, because I'm hearing from affordable housing developers, to see if we can definitely increase um, that, that range that's being given for funding. Sorry. Well, from the 200 to 380, oh, got it. definitely we want to... Yes increase that amount because Got of market it. conditions. Got it. Um, the other, my other advocacy is always for home ownership units. And um, how, are we, how are we prioritizing uh, developing more home ownership units uh, through the RFPs? Um, and on page, I don't know what page it's in, but where you're, where you're breaking down uh, new rental units versus new home ownership units, um, it's not even half, right? It's probably a, a less than a third of new construction that's home ownership. Mm -hmm. So how, how are we going to, you know, we're already 66% city of renters. Um, I'm hoping that, you know, Mayor's Office of Housing, like our goal is to either slow that down from increasing or completely flip it on its head. Yeah. Um, how, how do we, you know, make sure that these dollars are influencing the yeah. creation of more home ownership units. So we are doing, <clears throat> maybe this is not a, not a very satisfactory answer, but we are doing a lot more home ownership projects than we ever have. I think our pipeline is 500, 600 units or something. 900, oh my God, I've been asleep at the switch. 900. <clears throat> so um, I, I think we're only limited by, well, we're, we're probably most limited by resources, right? So a, a, an affordable rental project will have, as you know, 10 sources, low-income housing tax credits, home, affordable housing trust. It will just have all of these state and federal resources. And home ownership has one other besides us, and that's right. Commonwealth Builder. So, and, and it's just, so it's just trying to make sure that we can fund all of the, you know, uh, all of the, uh, the home ownership projects that are coming our way. Right. And we're limited to and how much Commonwealth Builder money we can get because the state's not willing to give us their whole authorization. Right. I think the bond bill, which should pass by sometime tomorrow, mm -hmm. uh, is going to have a lot more resources for home ownership. So I'm hoping that we'll be able to also increase that, that pipeline of 900, not 500, but 900. Right. And, and I, I'm not 100% familiar with the bond bill, but yeah. it feels like it's a windfall, one-time cash um, Mm -hmm. you know, stimulus to the mm -hmm. production. Are, are we thinking about how do we, you know, maybe it's increasing, you know, the subsidies or the, you know, funding for home ownership <laughs> to make sure that home ownership production is more sustainable after the bond bill? Yeah, I think we're going to have to have a conversation with the state too, because their state is going to have, the state often looks to us for like, like with home ownership, a 50-50 match. Right. Uh, with with rental, it's a little less than that, certainly. But 
because we didn't, the transfer fee didn't pass, and we're all still like, you know, just I know. And thank you all for supporting it. And and um, I'm heartbroken, but because the state's going to have more resources than we are, right. um, we're going to have to have a conversation with them. I just haven't want to broach it until the thing passes and say the city's not going to be able to fund like as much as we have been, or you're going to have more money than we do. So can we contribute less and, and still continue to have a very, very large pipeline? So those conversations are going to have to be forthcoming, and we might need your help. Anytime when it comes to home ownership. Um, and then just a clarifying question on pro program management costs. Mm -hmm. um, can you just elaborate, give sure. me examples? Yeah, yeah so since, um, since the IDP fund was transferred to MOH back in 2014, we've had an agreement with the BPDA that we would split um, between five and seven and a half percent of the collection, the average collections we split to use for um, like oversight costs. So that goes to compliance staffing, legal legal costs, and enforcing enforcing the affordable housing agreements. It's mostly it's mostly staff um, it's mostly who are staff. administering the programs. Yeah, okay. it's about I think it's about a million dollars a year that we spent um, out of the you know. I think it's on average probably 15, 16 million in, in, in collections. So but that's how you get the 10 million over 10 years, basically. Awesome. And I just want to just point out uh, one of the projects that um, I love this model, um, parcel 12C, Chinatown. Uh, it says it's 36 home ownership units yeah. with 96 rental units. Yeah. And sometimes developers say it can't happen, home ownership and rentals. But glad to see that it's happening here. Thank you. Great. You done? <laughs> Good, thank you. Um, many of my questions have already been asked, but um, the one um, looking into the you know the history of the program in 2014, 2014, it was transferred from BPDA over to you folks, but then the the Treasury Department um, it's at that time they said that the Treasury Department would have a, would have a greater role in ensuring that developers pay their obligations in full and on time, and that the fund would be subject to annual financial audits performed by independent third parties. Like, I think that was our, we, in preparation for this hearing, we had questions about Treasury. Like, what's the role of Treasury? Uh, do they have a role in ensuring, you know, like a, a cop on the beat, so to speak, to make sure that developers are paying their, uh, 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 the money on time and uh, in full? Yeah, I would say, I mean, we are, we're really, we're doing that. Treasury is there, like, if we, if we need their kind of heft and their, you know, them to come in to, um, to help us, um, you know, ensure that uh, developers are paying their fees. As of right now, we have, there are no projects that are, you know, delinquent that, that we, you know, I mean, there are some that we're, like, working with and we're actively engaged with collecting fees, but it's really um, a few. So we're, MOH is really taking on that role. I started at MOH eight years ago, and at that time, we were in conversations with Treasury to talk about should they should they have a bigger role. And I think we all agreed that like it's our department that's tracking um, the projects, tracking the permits, so we know when the payments are coming do, are are being triggered. Um, and so we have taken over the responsibility, and I think done a done a, a really good job over the past seven eight years of sending out invoices, tracking when they're due. Um, going after uh, developers who are, you know, not uh, paying their obligations when they're supposed to, and working with Treasury to, you know, to, to the extent that we need their help in, in making sure that um, the, the bills are being paid. Yeah. So that seems like an onerous responsibility for the MOH. I, I, I do hope that you're being adequately compensated. Your program, <laughs> program management costs are adequate, because that's a fair... That's a lot of yeah. terrain to, to follow, to cover. It, it, and it, like I said, you know, it, it certainly was for the first, again, during my time here, it was during the first few years. The number of projects has, it has become so small now that it really, it's not, I would say the, the work has really, uh, has, has really gone down. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's uh, invoicing a handful of projects a year, more than a handful, but um, it's not an overwhelming number of projects that are paying into the, into the fund, which is, a, you know, on the one hand is a concern because the fund has become such a great, important source for us, but on the other hand, Again, that was intentional because so many units are being built on site and off site, which is what the city wanted. Yeah, so that's a much pref much more preferable option. Like, if it's a choice between building on site and building on, can you talk to just for folks watching what what, what the advantages yeah. are? And I, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier. You know, a, a lot of the development, not all, certainly. In fact, we're seeing a lot more development now in our outer neighborhoods. But for years and years, it was a lot of downtown development where the percentage of affordable housing is lower than the citywide average. 
So we felt it was important, and most communities felt it was very important too, that market rate developments built their units on site because they too want affordable units in their neighborhood. Um, and we're very, um, we're very committed to mixed income, uh, racially diverse uh, buildings and neighborhoods, and it was it was a way to really ensure that. So for so many reasons, um, it was good to get, but you know, especially these very very high end buildings to to have regular folk live in those buildings and building and people that really need the housing. So it really has been our for always out of the gate. We want the units on site, unless, like I said to Councillor Fernandez Anderson, like unless it is so so beneficial to us financially that sometimes we'll, we'll, we'll analyze it, of course have community conversations, but take, take the resources so we can help five, six, seven, eight projects. You know? So sometimes you just, it's just the, the amount of money that could be generated can do, can, we can really spread out a lot of that good. So are you anticipating a, a slowdown like in terms of so many more um, units are being built on site, you won't have as much money in the kitty, so to speak? Yes, um, for yes for the IDP fund, like, yes. uh, what, what are you anticipating you in know. terms of projections for that? Yeah, I, I, I'll have to go back and, and look. I mean, I think we're, the next few years, I think we're okay because, again, most projects up, you know, have been paying in over seven years. So they're still on their, like, seven-year um, payment cycle, and we have a few very large projects that are, that have been, uh, that are paying in right now. Um, but I think if you look out three, four, five years, unless some new projects, you know, unless some new cash outs um, happen that are not, that we're not, that are not currently on our radar, I think we will, we can expect the fund, the fund to go down uh, pretty low to, you know, maybe a few million dollars a year. I mean, I hope not, um, but, but yeah, I, I think that is a possibility. That's why we have to put the squeeze on the state then. Get yeah, the and then, there. right, so that, to my point, and then we're also seeing, as you all know, a decrease in the commercial development pipeline so linkage is going to go down so we've we do have to have some and the state's a great partner they've been really very helpful but we are going to have less to contribute to projects that we're both participating in and i have a question as well about um just home ownership projects i know our neighborhood is particular and alston brighton district nine particularly particularly low levels of home ownership mm -hmm. um, i know alston and mission hill are the two lowest neighborhoods in the city for home ownership right. i think Thanks somewhere right. around 10 percent um, like, how do we incentivize, how do, like, I know, and I, it really makes me upset, I know we've had these conversations, Sheila, about developers who build a home ownership project and then decide to say, oh no, sorry, we're not doing that anymore, we're going to do rentals instead. Like, how do we, how do we work in that, with that situation? I, I, you know, we have talked about a few in particular in your, in, in your district where the developer has gotten approval uh, at, for a home ownership project and then it, they indeed built condominiums and then rented out every single one of the condominiums. You know, I think, you know, and I'm not an attorney, but I think um, probably <clears throat> it, it's worth uh, in those early meetings to say how do we safeguard against this and how do we get some assurances from the developer that that will not happen. Um, it may make it harder for the developer to get financing because you know you always want to keep all options open but it seems to me there's it's just going to happen very very early on because once once uh, condominiums are built their developers can rent them out and they have indeed built what they said they would build. They built condominiums. So I, it's got to be some, something early, early on in the conversation, you know, conversations and community process. That's a, not a great answer, but I, I, you yes. know, I don't know what the legal mechanism is or could be, but I, I think it's worth exploring with any developer that comes forward with a condominium project. Yeah, because so often there's a huge, there's, a, there's a, an untapped demand there, and so often our community support a project that's a home ownership project because it is a home ownership project and then they sort of <clears throat> do a bait and switch on us and we're left holding the bit yeah. left with um, and any empty you know promises. I would be um, and this is my opinion I would be hesitant to allow them to change the project over to a rental project because they're stating they can't sell it when we all know if something is reasonably priced it, it will sell yeah thank you the other question I had was really uh, about the authorization for to to uh, to roll into a second fiscal year. Like, uh, can you ex explain why uh, why we're doing that again? I think you've already alluded to it in your previous comments with um, Councillor. Yeah, in, in the past, if I if I go back um, 
starting from before my time here, the, the, um, the requests haven't always lined up nicely with the, with the fiscal years. So um, I think our, you know, we, it's, uh, we have a projection of how much revenue we think we're going to take in in, a, in any given year. Mm -hmm. We are occasionally surprised by a project that we thought was going to be paying in you know, in a year or two when they pull their permits earlier, something happens and they, the project moves forward and they end up, the payment ends up happen, happening um, sooner than we, than we thought. So I think our, our thinking was, um, like I said, we don't want to kind of bump up against that authority and be in a position where we can't accept or expend uh, a payment. We want to be able to use it, you know, as soon as we get it, we want to be able to have the flexibility to use it as soon as we can. So it's possible that, this, that we will get up to this $224 million amount within the next fiscal year. I think it's looking at the, you know, our tracking of the upcoming payments, it might take us into, into the following fiscal year, and we'd be back, you know, we'd be back here probably, you know, next fall, say, to, mm -hmm. to, 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 with our next request of, of funding for the, for the following, following year. And do you have any projected idea about what, what the, our, this next RFP, the ask will be in, in, the demand, in terms of demand for funds in the next, the next mm -hmm. cycle? Do you mean the overall RFP that yeah in 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 each cycle what what sort of anticipated um, demand do you see demand so I'm doing this from memory a little bit but lately um, we have seen demand far exceed whatever we're putting out so we're putting out uh, in in several weeks right we're putting out inclusionary development we're putting out linkage and we're putting out CPA yeah. yep. uh, I think we're totaling forty million dollars total um, and. I, I think we already know about a hundred million dollar projects are coming in. So we need to find more money. <laughs> we need to find more money. Yes, and that's that's why we're but still. You, just you know, Sheila mentioned mentioning. I mean, CPA I think has been a godsend too uh, with IDP revenue. You know, looking the, the the outlook for IDP revenue looking um, uh, bleak. I think CPA revenue has been a huge um, boon for us for for housing. It's great that the city's had that for the past. Five or six years. Yeah, so. because they're they're even though there's a lot of uh, interest for open space and historic preservation, they have consistently said we're going to fund about 50 percent of the CPA revenue. We're going to set aside for housing. So it's it's really been it's been a good relationship. Yeah, very good. Thank you. Uh, see, Commissioner, do we have any any? Um, do you want to make a just a wrap up closing statement? Or, oh, sorry, are you still <laughs> Sorry, I need a periscope. That's okay. Um, Councillor Fernandez Anderson. All the time. <laughs> um, it, thank you, Madam Chair. I was really curious in uh, Council Fitzgerald's train of thought about you know looking at the comparison between like the housing stock that we need in comparison to what we're investing, I think he was trying to figure out like how much percentage of each revenue a source that we're spending yeah. overall in housing in the city of Boston. Have you done um, the math to figure out like what's needed in comparison to what we're spending? I haven't done it recently. I think though if um, we can do it. So we, we, we generally know how many of our residents are rent burdened or or I think we know we, we can look and say there's inequities with home ownership and, and what it would take to uh, have an equitable home ownership landscape in the city. So I mean if we take those buckets, you know, students that are rent burdened, you know, but really focusing on the on the pop I care about students, but the populations that are gonna be here permanently, we could look at what we think the needs are what we're generally spending to create affordable home ownership and rental units and come up with a number. It's going to be a magnificent number. It's going to be huge. Um, but we could do that. We could do that exercise if that would be helpful. Meanwhile, Might be depressing, but we could do it. <laughs> um, I mean, meanwhile, I guess it's interesting to, when we're talking about displacement because of certain yeah. restrictions with federal uh, revenues where we can't necessarily um, prioritize by demographics or location even, um, then we get into this, uh, this juggle of we are building, but we're building at 180 AMI, and the people that are here can't mm -hmm. afford it. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're sort of recruiting. We are gentrifying. And there is no such thing as development without displacement. We're all aware. However, um, I guess just interested in, you know, obviously looking at those numbers, but also like in figuring out 
how many of our people in Boston, like Boston residents, are we actually housing in comparison to those who are coming by way of shelter or DV situations? Yeah. And as you know, we can't pick and choose where people are coming from, uh, mass and cast, or any of those yeah. um, addiction population, people suffering from addiction. Um, then, you know, just figuring out, are we filtering people out by way of gentrification? Are we... Are we, are, we, are we solving the issue or are we building stock and obviously supply and demand, but um, further just propelling this cycle of gentrification? Mm -hmm. And how can we not? Like, we have to keep building. Yeah. So a couple of thoughts. Um, so we can, if we're putting funding, if we're funding and the state's funding projects, which is generally how it works, 70% of those units can be um, set aside for Boston residents. We can't give neighborhood preference yet, and we're having staff actually looking at this again and talking to New York and San Francisco that have been in lawsuits over this uh, recently. But we can say these are for Boston residents. So that's, that is, that's helpful. Um, we are starting to look at, within our programs, can we give some preference for families and, and individuals who are currently rent burdened and at risk. And because, <clears throat> and maybe you've heard me say this before, I, hope, I don't want to repeat myself, but a lot of the folks that can access our housing programs are the folks that are, uh, are, are the most set up to do so. And I'm not blaming them, they want, they want, they want a, a nice place to live as well. But they you know, probably have access to a computer or they probably are working one job, not three, and they can actually organize their application process. Or they're maybe living at home with their parents and they're getting some assistance to help figure out the program, whatever it is, right? People that have the less, have less uh, chaos and desperation in their lives are more likely to organize a housing search. So we're wondering, can we start prioritizing not all the units, but some of the units for folks that are really rent burdened and that are struggling? And that way, we got the Boston residents priority, but then really targeting people that really are looking at displacement. And I, and I think I'd love to discuss it with you all when we kind of land on a potential policy. But um, so trying to think about how we, with the units we're creating, how are we ensuring that the, the folks that need them are, are being, are being you know, can access those. It's really complicated, but, but I'd, I'd love to, so we are giving that a lot of thought, but we can, we can um, prioritize Boston residents, which I think is, a, is we need to do. Once uh, a family is deemed homeless and has this homeless status, mm -hmm. you can get a yes. letter certified. Yeah. Um, uh, they are considered Boston residents? Yes, yes, they are. And in rental projects, 10% of our units, the only, probably the only, the only units that a, a family that is currently homeless could afford would be the homeless set-aside units, and that's 10% of the total. I see. So fair to say that of that 10%, that's, I mean, that's very small, I'm not concerned, right? right? I mean, if half of that are people coming outside of Boston, okay. Um, so maybe we're addressing about 65% of Boston residents. Um, and so I guess, you know, I look forward to the convers more conversation with you. Um, I know we have a pending uh, working session with the council to look at metrics, and I just, I wanted to get your feedback about just sort of uh, mechanisms to, for accountability in terms of what does success look like with something like this, and mm -hmm. what would be the metrics or, you know, certain benchmarks that we could be implementing or monitoring to make, ensure that we are, we are succeeding. Yeah. Um, according to whatever objectives that we set out, and it seems like you know this this would be something that we would we would say you know this funding is to address this, and then how do we measure that? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so, I did have I I can I can reserve my um, the rest of my questions, um, mostly the five million grant. Really interested um, in further conversation about um, just the wraparound specific. I think. You know, sometimes we use that term loosely, but then what does that actually translate to mm -hmm. um, in terms of implementation? Yeah. Um, but uh, I know that you are um, extremely receptive. I tell everyone um, I'm, I'm a huge fan because I, I respect you. I respect the work that you do. I know that you are brilliant in your position. And um, 
you're just always very respectful and receptive to meetings with me. Yeah. Thank you very much. We get great ideas from y'all. So, you know, not everyone can be implemented, but um, no, I, I, I think it's a good partnership. I, I do. Thank I do. I have one more question I had, I had was with regard to in perpetuity. Um, mm -hmm. How do we define in perpetuity? Like if it was in my book, I think in perpetuity would be forever, but yeah. <laughs> um, I think we don't want to run into the situation like we do with um, HUD uh, expiring use type uh, housing that, you know, mm -hmm. if, we, if we built something 25 years ago, it's this, the clock's ticking and it's going to mm -hmm. be pulled out of the pool of uh, IDP um, units available uh, in another five years or whatever. Well, how do we handle that? What's what's your thoughts on that? So the um, the since 1998, I think I've got that date right. The city, if we are funding a project, not home ownership, but if we're funding a rental project, we are requiring affordability and perpetuity. Now the definition. Um, I, I'm not an attorney. Can you want to do it? Yeah, okay, great. Well, we um, actually recently had a question from a, um, a colleague about perpetuity, um, and for MOH funded rental projects, it is in perpetuity to how we all understand that definition forever. Mm -hmm. um, for IDP projects currently, it's um, 30 years plus the option to extend for 20 years for rental and home ownership units. With um, MOH taking over the oversight of the IDP program, we are looking at if we're able to do a similar, you know, true perpetuity for IDP projects. You have to get um, in the state law. Um, you have to get approval from the executive office for, of housing and livable communities for each project. So there's a kind of process set of work that we need to do that we figured out for our MOH rental projects that haven't yet been fit, figured out for IDP projects that were. That's something that we're looking into now that's come over to um, the city of Boston. Yeah. I know how hard we work to develop affordable housing. We don't want it to sort of start sliding off at the end again. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we don't want to spend, I mean, it's one thing to spend money on making sure our affordable communities have updated kitchens and baths. It's quite another when you have to pay, you know, a current owner a lot of money just to keep the affordability going. So we want to avoid the latter, certainly. Yeah. yeah. Very good. I don't have any other questions. Do you have any other? Um, mm -hmm. Fernandez Anderson and my other colleagues. Um, any any closing comments? No, I just want to thank my colleagues for for their hard work, making sure that our you know we we take the we take our funding very seriously, and we really try to make sure that we're spending it wisely, and then we're monitoring the project. So, appreciate your consideration of the accept and expense. Thank you. Thank you all. Sure. Uh, this um, close the session. This uh, hearing to uh, this hearing on docket 0633 and 0695 is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.